welcome to worship at Carroll's Creek Baptist Church, and more importantly, welcome into the presence of the Lord, for where two or more are gathered in His name, He has promised to be there with them, so He is with us. Let's begin our worship as we read from His Word, Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. Enter into His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him, and bless His name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and His truth endures to all generations. This is the Word of the Lord. This is the house of God. He is here. Let us worship Him with all of our hearts, minds, souls, and strengths. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. He's worthy of our worship. <clears throat> worthy of worship. Most high. The name 
name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it. Sing. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord most high. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder. Nothing has the power to save but your name. Therefore, the prisoner of the Lord beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. With all lowliness and gentleness and long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, 
and in you all. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm in lost in the valley. It's by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. I'm a part of the family, the family of
What a beautiful name it is. What a glorious name. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus that changes everything. Let me ask you to turn your Bible, please, to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. In our pilgrimage this year, Vision 2020, this mini-series we've been embarking in the last uh, several weeks is about building our spiritual home. And we've seen that to build that spiritual home, you have to place four corner posts. And those are the corner posts of worship, prayer, the Word of God, and sacrificial, selfless service. Now, for those posts to have significance, there has to be commitment. And let's use the illustration we've gone with for a while, and that is of a house that you're building, wood, mortar, brick. And you build with those corner posts, or in most cases today, they put up those prefabricated walls that are already made. But nonetheless, there's that superstructure that has to be put there. Now, you couldn't move into that house, so you have to do some other things to make that house livable. There has to be a roof, <laughs> walls, floors, electricity, plumbing. Then you have to furnish it. You have to decorate it with uh, the furnishings you bring in, pictures you hang on the wall, all those things. Before it's a house that you would want to move your family into. Similarly, with your spiritual house, you have to have the superstructure. And to that, you build the the spiritual roof and walls and all those other items that make it a spiritual home into which you can live and move into with God. Now, here's how those other aspects, the walls, the roof, and so forth, come about. It's by our commitment to the essence of those corner posts. Our commitment to daily worship God, to daily be in prayer, to daily be in the Word to learn about God and who He is and what He would have us to do, and then to put all those into practical everyday service that's sacrificial and selfless. But we're not through. Not yet. The house then has to be decorated in a way that not only is it spiritually functional for you, but it's attractive for other people. And I call that the decoration. And that's where Ephesians, uh, sorry, Galatians 5 will come in to play as we look at some scriptures that deal with the decorating, the spiritual decorating of our homes. I've actually coined a phrase. You know what DNA is, dinucleic nuclear, something, you know. Uh, those of you that are science guys and gals, y'all know what that is. But then I want to coin another DNA. Divine, noble attributes. Say that with me. Divine, noble attributes. Spiritual DNA. That which God infuses into the life of His born-again children so that their lives can reflect Christ. You see, in Galatians 5, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, it's talking about the character of God. And these are not nine different fruit in a cluster. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's that which we see in a life that is filled with Christ. So this is how we're going to decorate, I think, beautifully decorate our home. We'll look at three of these DNAs, spiritual, divine, noble attributes of God that He calls us to emulate in our lives. We will look at three this week, and then the next two Sundays we'll look at three each of those. And then we'll have it put together. And my hope and prayer for you and for me today is that we will continue to commit to that process of building our spiritual homes 
in a way that first and foremost it honors God and then it draws others to the same faith that we have. I'm working off a premise today, a couple of premises. One is this, that most if not all who are here and those who are live streaming with us and thank you for joining with us today, that most if not all are born again believers in Jesus Christ. Cleansed by the blood, you have been born again into the family of faith, moved from darkness to light in His glorious self. Now that's one premise. And then the second premise is this, that you are doing what you need to with those four basic corner posts. What were they again? Worship, prayer, study of God's Word to get to know God, and then self-sacrificing service. Those things that you are implementing into your life, those bring honor to God. And now we're going to put it all together and bring about that final spiritual house that will then attract others not to ourselves, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's stand together in honor of God as we read His Word. Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, but let us decorate our spiritual house with that which is divine, noble, attributes of God. Pray with me, please. Father, teach us in these precious moments what you would have us to do with the characteristics that are of God, the fruit of the Spirit that you promised to born-again believers through the Spirit that dwells within us. Father, we thank you for this privilege of being in your Word, this privilege of worshiping, this privilege of prayer, and the greatest privilege of all, being in your presence. Thank you, dear God, for teaching us now. And then give us the strength, the courage, the will to follow your lead in building our spiritual dwellings. For Father, it's not about us. This spiritual house is your house where you dwell, let us do well in our building. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, and please be seated. There's some vital truths I want to share with you before we get into these first three spiritual DNAs. First of all, we need to know that the fruit of the Spirit, as seen in the life of a born-again child of God, is an outward indicator that you are His child. Look there in Galatians chapter 5. Those first few verses there uh, talk about, verses 19, 20, and 21, talk about things that are, well, endemic to humanity. In fact, a plague within humanity. If, if you turn over... Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 speaks about basically some of the same things where he says in verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6, do, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators or adulterers or, or idolaters or homosexuals or sodomites or thieves or covetous nor drunkards nor revilers nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. He paints a broad picture of the sinfulness of mankind there, just as he did in the verses uh, we looked at in Galatians. But listen to this. And such were some of you. Such were. That one little word, isn't that awesome? Such were some of us. Listen, we may not fit the mold of any of these particular sinful characteristics, 
But we've all seen and come short of the glory of God. And to His praise, we were sinners. But now, through the grace of God in Christ, we have become the righteousness of God in Christ. And that's why Paul would say, and those who are in Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. So that's the first thing to know. A, a believer's citizenship in the kingdom of God is manifested in the fruit of the Spirit that he bears or she bears in her daily living. You can go over to John chapter 15, about verse 8, and you'll see Jesus saying that we must bear fruit. Therefore, as we bear fruit, we prove that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And then it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, those three we look at today. Then patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control we'll look at in the next couple of weeks. A second vital truth is a reminder, we will face spiritual battles even though we are born again children of God. The enemies of our spiritual lives will come against us. Satan, the world order, and yes, the old sinful nature. There again in Galatians 5, verse 17, for the flesh lust or wars, battles against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not know uh, rather, you do not do the things that you would want to do. We have battles. Aren't we glad that we can thank God through Jesus Christ that we are more than conquerors? That we can put aside the things that bombard us on a daily basis, the sin that so easily besets us, as Paul said, and we can be overcomers, more than conquerors, through Christ who loves us. I hope you're, you're grasping the fact that it's that person who is in Christ, following Him. Those four pillars, we're working on those, and then when we are working on those, God promises to add to us these spiritual attributes that are like unto God Himself. Now, a third vital truth about your spiritual house and the fruit of the Spirit is this. We must understand that God's Word promises that anyone who is in Christ can be that overcomer, can build their spiritual house well, can beautify it so that God is honored and others are drawn to Christ. Look at Galatians again, and that is verse 24. Those who are in Christ have put away the things of the flesh, overcome them. And you and I have both been in situations where we have talked with folks, well, let's be honest, it's just not easy sometimes to talk with some people because they don't want to hear anything about the love of God. They don't want to hear anything about the church. They just want to be what they want to be. And that's a tragic place. All the more reason that when we meet those people, we should exemplify love, joy, and peace in the other fruit of the Spirit. Because if we stand uh, in opposition to them and rebuke them and re rebuff them and reject them, they're not likely to hear the gospel message again. But if we share in the love of Christ, with the joy of Christ and the peace of Christ about us, it will happen. We still face spiritual battles. And then understand, fourthly, that the fruit of the Spirit is not a cluster of nine different fruit. It is the character of God Himself in nine beautiful, diamond-like, sparkling facets that emulate His very image in and through the life of Christ. Let me quickly say, that type of spiritual DNA, the divine, noble attributes of God, they're not in us naturally. Can you hear an amen? <laughs> They're not in us naturally. But when we come to Christ, they are part of who we are supernaturally because God brings them. Remember what Jesus said, He's not going to leave us, but He will send the Spirit. And the Spirit will teach us, the Spirit will show us, the Spirit will lead us. And as we have the Spirit about us, then these spiritual DNAs can come about and they'll be part of who we are 
all the days of our lives. Now, the divine noble attribute that is the first on our list today is that of love. Love. Jesus said there was no greater commandment than to love. In Matthew 22, Jesus was asked, Good Master, what is the greatest commandment? He said, To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the other is likened to it. To love your neighbor as yourself. To love. That's the essence of of the law, he said. It all hangs on love. Agape love. God's type of love for us. To love with the love that God has loved us with is shown through that self-sacrificing service. It's shown through our love and our joy and our peace and all the other fruit of the Spirit, the lightness of God. It is desiring for other people the very best for them spiritually, physically, and emotionally. And doing all we can as a child of God to reflect how God can benefit them. That is to love with the love of God. To so love is not always easy. Every once in a while, you know, you and I may come up against somebody that's hard to love. Sometimes that person may even be us. We may be the ones that are hard to love sometimes. I was given this little ditty that I think is, is kind of worded. It's, it's a little bit of humor. It says, To live above with saints who have been made whole will truly be great glory. But to live below with saints we know, (laughs) that's a different story. (laughs) Sometimes, sometimes it's hard to love. But we're called to love. You know what I, I think? I believe the Word of God will back it up. Those who need to be loved the most are the ones that are hardest to love. They need to see Jesus more than anybody. Would you agree with that? And that's hard, but God said, listen, I will help you. I will enable you. Live in the structure of your spiritual house on the basics. Let your foundation be your relationship with Christ, and then you can look forward to sharing with others. The Gospel of John, in John chapter 3, says this about love. I mean, 1 John chapter 3, how we love our fellow believers is an indication of our loving God. Let me read that very vital. 1 John chapter 3, verse 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. We love one another. We love those of the family of faith. But Jesus, remember, also said, love your neighbor yourself. Your neighbor, not necessarily a member of the family of faith, but someone that needs the love of God exemplified through us, love. Paul places love at the top of each of his spiritual list of godly attributes. Love is the best, the greatest of all. Now by the faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And the greatest of these is love. Love. Jesus puts an incalculable value on love. He says this, by your love for one another, all men will know that you are my disciples. In other words, when, when the church loves, church loves fellow believers, and the world sees that, it's an evidence that we are children of God. It is a proclamation to the world that there is something worthy about being part of that family of God. And I am, by the way, when I sing, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God, I always say, I'm so glad I'm a part of this family of God. Aren't you? Amen. Thank you. Thank you for Carroll's Creek Baptist Church. The second aspect of 
this divine noble attributes, this DNA which is spiritual, these characteristics of God is joy. Joy. Now, now joy is used 70 times in the New Testament. Paul uses it often. Jesus uses it several times. Other writers have used it often. Uh, the Apostle John and others. But joy is not something that is tied to external circumstances. Joy, biblical joy, joy that we have in our spiritual nature, that divinely given noble attribute of God, isn't directed because of external circumstances. We can can be sorrowful and grieve and yet have joy. We can be in the midst of great trials and difficulties, still have joy, because joy is not tied to those external circumstances. Joy is a deep felt well-being of the soul that is endemic to the heart of the believer because he or she knows all is well with their relationship with Almighty God. It's the, it's the type of joy that Horatio Spafford had, and, and most of you know that great story, how Spafford's family, his wife and three daughters, were on a, a steamer coming across the Atlantic Ocean, and a tragic event took place and the ship went down and his wife would wire him across the ocean all lost save I when Spafford got on the next steamer to go to meet his wife he asked the captain for the coordinates of where the ship his daughters had perished on went down. And the captain, when he found those, alerted Spafford. And on the deck of that ship, where he lost his family, he wrote the words, It is well, it is well with my soul. That's joy. In the midst of sorrow, in the midst of grief, in the midst of difficulties, God's Holy Spirit is often the greatest to bring joy when the difficulties are the worst. When we truly have the Spirit of God about us. Joy is not a human emotion. Joy is a gift from God. The second spiritual DNA is given and produces delight in life, regardless of circumstances gets us through the circumstances where we can still have a joy because we have fellowship with God. The last, let me, let me back up just a moment. Let me ask you a question. Can I have your permission to get real just for a moment about this thing of joy? Have you ever seen a joyless person in church? You ever seen a joyless person? We have. Sometimes we may be that joyless. joyless. And, and when, it, when it endures, I mean, there's going to be times when we are burdened and we're in the process of, of giving those, like Jesus said, bring your burdens to me. There's going to be times when we're so burdened that, that we don't seem to have joy. But when, when we continue to see, we know when a person's joyful or not has Jesus in their life. And when that's not there, Something, some disconnect has happened. It's very possible that when a person is joyless consistently that they don't have a connection with Jesus. They don't have fellowship with the Lord. May not even have a relationship with the Lord. Or it could be they're just temporarily burdened with life. Did you know real joy is just as discernible as the lack thereof in life. Just like you've been around people in church that lack joy for whatever reason, you also have been around people that 
express joy. You, you see their joy. You understand their joy. You see it in their lives. I was talking with one of our men in our prayer time this morning, and he shared a great truth. Just about everything about Christianity can be faked except the fruit of the Spirit. Now, for a time, what it is that you can fool all the time, all the people some of the time, and some of the people all the time, you can't fool all the people all the time? Well, there's going to come a time if we're faking one of these fruit of the Spirit that it's going to come out. But, but you cannot fake these and continue to not be detected. First of all, the Spirit of God will come and, and convict you. And then others will see that also. Joy. Joy is observable. It is real. And it comes through fellowship with God. Now let's move on to the peace. The peace of God that passes understanding. Peace is a lot, also a lot like joy. It's not tied to external circumstances. Peace, however, deals with a lot of God's presence in your life now and for eternity. I want you to one, one day just, just go online and, and noodle, if that's the right word, uh, look for something like this. Promises from God. Promises from God. And you'll find that an absolute treasure chest full of promises God has made for us right now. I'll not leave you. I will come to you. I will send my spirit. Come unto me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden. Find rest for your souls. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The promises that God gives Jesus said, you don't have to be troubled in this life. I've overcome this world. You're going to have trials and tribulations, but I've overcome so you can be an overcomer also. Right now, as we walk through this life, the promises of God for the here and now are so incredibly immense that we should have peace. Why? Because we can trust His promises. Peace comes through our relationship with God, that we know He is present, working for us right now. In fact, Jesus is said to have ascended at the right hand of the throne of God, and He is making intercession right now for you. He knows your name. He knows your need. He knows your heart. He's making intercession to the Father for you right now. Promises for the now. But listen, there's also promises for the future that help us to have peace. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, now and forever. What did Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, he's going to do what? I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. What a promise. We see all the book of Revelation, the promise of God sustaining grace for his people, but also the glory that is set before us. That glory that's inexpressible, that Paul said, I have not seen, hears not heard, neither is entered the heart of man. But do you know what that next verse is? But he has shown us. Man without God cannot have peace because he cannot see the glories to come. But those of us who have Christ, by his spirit, he delivers to us a view, a, if you will, portal into the glories of God. Not at all. We couldn't handle it all. 
but He gives us enough to give us joy and to give us peace because we are His. His promises now. His promises forever bring peace because He is perfectly trustworthy. Dear beloved child of God, when you face the trials and the tribulations of life, remember His love. God so loved the world. God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son. Remember that He calls us to love as one of those attributes that shows we belong to Him. Remember that the love He calls you to will reach other people. Help others know that you are His disciple. It's not easy in our world, but it gives God glory. Remember when you're overcome and overwhelmed in life, and those times will happen. Remember that He provides joy. The joy of being a child of God. Walk with Him. We must commit and stay to the commitments of the essence of those Four corner posts. Daily worship. Daily prayer. Daily study of the Word of God. And daily self-sacrificing service. All of these help us to know God better. Help us to love Him more. Trust Him more. Gives us greater joy. And in the love and the peace, we then have that contentment of soul called Peace, love, joy, peace. And by the way, Jesus said, my peace I give you, not as the world gives. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Do you have that love of Christ that lifts you up, gives you joy and peace? If so, let the world see. Decorate your spiritual house with those fruit of the Spirit, those divine, noble attributes of God. When you do that, you honor God and you draw others to Christ. And here's the reason why. Those show others God. They show others the Lord Jesus. They show others that there's something worthy about walking as a child of God, about being a born-again Christian. And most of all, remember this, the house, the spiritual house we're talking about, we're not sitting in it. It's not this building of brick and mortar. It's not the house where you get your mail and reside. The spiritual house that we build and decorate is Christ as the foundation. It is the dwelling place of God. We are His building. Let us build well. Let us rejoice in the building. And let us truly rejoice that He has promised in Philippians that He will enable us. In fact, I want to close with that verse from Philippians. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident, here it is, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. God promises peace, joy, His love will also bring others through you to Christ. That's some good news. Let's thank Him for that. Father, we praise You for Your Word today, for the encouragement that it brings to us that we are already victorious. And we just need to walk with You. And we need to be always prepared to share the hope that's within us through Jesus Christ so that others can see your love in us. Others can see that joy, that peace that 
being loved by you brings. And others can be drawn to you. Father, I pray right now that you help each of us to renew our commitment to build our spiritual house, your dwelling place in us, to build well according to your word. Thank you that you've given us the blueprint and thank you that you've promised to be our spiritual superintendent of building as we submit and rely upon you. May Christ be in us and through us, for he is surely for us. And we praise you for your great gifts, and we ask our lives might truly honor and glorify your name. And we pray this through the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand, please? I love